Okay, so in this chapter, we will talk about the exponential law and its consequences. And um, before uh, we, we go into any proof details or so, let me, let me just state the exponential law and uh, talk a little bit about uh, why this is an important result and what we want to do with it. So um, the exponential law is the following theorem. So if we have a compact manifold and O and U open subsets of locally convex spaces, and uh, then the first statement of the exponential law is that if we have a mapping of two variables, U time, uh, on, on this product U times M, so open subset times manifold, into an open subset, if this mapping is smooth, then also the uh, joint map, so what I call this FV, uh, this is the map going from U to the C infinity functions, where you say, okay, um, if I uh, have FV of X, this gives me a smooth function from M to O, and the formula is if I want to evaluate the smooth function FV of X at a point Y, then it's just uh, the original function of two variables inserted in the first variable, the X, and the second variable, the Y. So um, the first statement is um, if the source manifold of this uh, space of smooth mappings is compact, then uh, uh, mapping of two variables can be or induces in a canonical way a smooth mapping into this manifolds of mappings, uh, which is given by this formula FV. Okay, and the second statement is uh, the evaluation map uh, from the same function space times uh, m into, uh, into o, this is a smooth map. And as a consequence, what we will see is that um, the assignment which sends smooth maps of two variables from u times m uh, to uh, smooth maps from u with values in the smooth maps uh, on m. Uh, so and the assignment is as in the first part, f gets mapped to fv. This is a bijection. Um, I should comment on several things here. So the first uh, is that uh, this is one of the weakest versions of the exponential law one can prove. So what do I mean by that? Um, we only claim here that this, uh, this assignment sends f to fv is a bijection. What you can actually prove is that if you endow all of the spaces, so the space on the left and um, well, the two function spaces on the right hand side with the compact open C infinity topology, you can prove that this assignment is not only a bijection but also a homeomorphism of the topological spaces. Um, so this is this is the first um, thing why this is what a relatively weak statement. I mean, compared to what you can actually prove. The other uh, thing why this is uh, weaker than uh, the need be is um, you don't need to assume that the U here, for example, is an open subset. You don't need to uh, assume that the O is an open subset of a locally convex space. You can prove a manifold version of this. Uh, the essential thing in all of these arguments is that uh, the manifold in the middle, so to speak, so this manifold M, this needs to be compact. If you drop this compactness assumptions uh, on the manifold M, then in general the exponential law is false. So there are rudimentary versions of, of a similar statement. However, they are much more technical and uh, they don't hold in, in this generality. So if M is a non-compact manifold, you cannot in general expect um, that uh, a similar statement will hold that, uh, that a mapping of two variables corresponds directly to a uh, mapping with which uh, is also smooth and takes values in the C infinity functions. And finally, um, another possible extension of this theorem is um, so we are doing we are dealing here with Bastiani smooth maps, uh, and everything is smooth. Uh, you can prove a suitable version of this exponential law also for finite orders of differentiability. However, then you get much more involved spaces and the topologies get, um, well, they are in principle what you expect. So you take a CK version of the topology of a, com uh, of a compact open topology. However, then you have to explain what you mean by um, 
the differentiability class of the mapping on this product because then you would have something like uh, you can for example differentiate k times with respect to the first component and l times with respect to the second component so in a way this um, theorem we are going to prove will be in uh, the easiest version available and it will allow us to avoid a lot of the technicalities you have to invest when you want the stronger versions and uh, if you look in the, le in the lecture notes um, there you will find uh, references to the stronger statements. Anyway, uh, it's, it's um, also important to say that even in this simple version, this exponential law is one of the most important results we were going to be talking about in these uh, lectures because this allows us to um, relegate questions of uh, differentiability of a mapping into an infinite dimension manifold to a question about the differentiability of a mapping on the product of finite dimensional uh, spaces or manifolds. Uh, was there a question? Okay. Um, then. One thing uh, we need to care immediately, so I've stated now this theorem, what is unclear at the moment, um, or at least it uh, should, should raise some eyebrows. So we talked in the previous chapter about uh, C infinity functions from a manifold with values in well, um, another manifold and with values in a vector space. Um, and we discussed so far only topological properties. So we can make sense, I mean, whatever, whatever the target here is, whatever this O here is, we can make sense of this uh, in a to as a topological space. So the C infinity functions from M to O, um, they carry the C in uh, compact open C infinity topology and they are a nice topological space. And uh, so the last time we established continuity properties. What is not clear at the moment, at least I haven't explained how to, how to view this, um, is uh, in which sense is the C infinity, are these C infinity functions from M with values in O a manifold? Because we are claiming here that the FV is a smooth map. So we need also that uh, the thing on the right hand side is a manifold. So we need to explain first, I mean, before we, before we split the proof of this theorem into a series of lemma, uh, we need to explain what we actually mean by the manifold structure on the C infinity functions from M with values in O. If O is the whole space, so if it's, um, uh, if it's the whole uh, locally convex space E, then we understand that the C infinity functions from M with values in E, they, are, they form a locally convex space. We've proved that. However, when O is an open subset, uh, which is properly smaller than, uh, than this locally convex space E, we don't know yet what uh, the manifold structure is. We need to explain what, what do I actually mean, uh, in which sense is this guy here on the right-hand side an infinite dimensional manifold. Okay, and uh, so let's uh, do this first. Let's explain how we can turn this into, a, um, into an infinite dimensional manifold. So, and uh, let's, uh, so which, sentence is uh, C infinity M O an infinite dimension manifold. That's the question here. And um, okay, so let's let's note two things. So by assumption M is compact. Okay, and um, O is an open set subset here of a locally convex space E. Uh, and uh, we endow C infinity M O always in this chapter and also in the following with uh, the compact open C infinity topology. And uh, we have seen um, that this topology is finer than the um, compact open topology. Um, so this is one property we know. And furthermore, C infinity M E is a locally convex space. Now, what is this 
uh, space C infinity M O. In principle, those are all the mapping, or we can think of this as all the mappings in the space of all smooth mappings from M with values in E, such that F maps all of the uh, domain into this open set. And uh, in other words, when you compare this with what we have done yesterday on the compact open topology, this is just the sub-basic compact open neighborhood uh, of all functions mapping M into this open set O. And this is an open subset of the C infinity functions from M to E. And this of, this of course uses in a crucial way that uh, our manifold M is compact. If M was not compact, this argument simply wouldn't work. And in a way, this is also what's behind uh, um, what was briefly discussed yesterday, that the compact open topology is only suitable, at least when we want to turn the C infinity functions into a manifold. Um, otherwise, if M was non-compact, uh, we would need a finer topology to make sense of these things. However, now, uh, what this small argument shows is that the C infinity functions from M to O, they form an open subset of a locally convex space. So um, this gives us uh, a manifold structure. So is a manifold as an open subset of C infinity M E. Okay, and um, so this explains what um, uh, or in in which way we can think of uh, the C infinity functions uh, into O as a manifold because we are we have we are just realizing this. Uh, so this realizes C infinity M O as an open submanifold of this topological uh, or to, uh, locally convex space C infinity from M to E. Uh, note further that um, a mapping uh, into the C infinity functions from M to O will be smooth if and only if it is smooth as a mapping into this larger locally convex space. And this was when you go back to the lecture on uh, infinite dimension manifolds, we had this, um, we had the statement, if you have a um, split sub-manifold of, a, of, a, of, of some ambient manifold, then a mapping into the sub-manifold is smooth if and only if um, it is smooth when you comp uh, compose it with the inclusion mapping of the sub-manifold into the larger mapping. Um, and we will be using this little trick later in an argument. So um, in, indeed, when, at least when it, uh, when it comes to the smoothness of mappings into this manifold C infinity MO, we can, uh, instead of testing smoothness into, uh, into the sub-manifold, we can test smoothness as a mapping into the larger locally convex space. Okay, and um, so basically this whole section will consist of, uh, of a proof for the exponential law as stated uh, up front. And um, we split all the technicalities into several auxiliary results, which we shall prove first. So um, it will be a bit technical to prove all of this, uh, these things. However, um, this is the price you pay for this, uh, for this important statement. Okay, so let's, let's see how, uh, what, we, what we prove first. So let's uh, establish first a lemma, which is uh, a part of, uh, of the exponential law. So let's assume we have E, F, and H locally convex spaces. And let's fix some open subsets in these locally convex spaces. 
and assume that we get a mapping f from u times v with values in h um, smooth. Then what we shall prove now is preliminary result. Then um, the uh, fv, so the associated map to f from u with values in c infinity from v to h uh, is smooth. And its derivative is given by the following formula. So I want to take the derivative of the fv. And um, so at some point x, don't care what the vector is at the moment. And it turns out that this is the partial derivative of the original function f. Uh, and I take the v of this and then evaluate in x. Okay, this is the formula 2, 1. Before we prove anything, let's comment a little bit on what is going on here. Um, on one hand, you see that the statement that the fv here is smooth, at least this statement doesn't seem to require the um, compactness of the set or the manifold on the left hand side. So we have this V here and the V is an open subset of a locally convex space. So it's certainly uh, not compact, right? Um, however, what uh, I mean, I, when we were talking about the exponential law, I was, uh, I was quite um, um, open about this, that we need compactness of the source manifold. So why does this uh, FV mapping uh, now turn out to be smooth? I mean, even if we don't have compactness of the V. The point here is that we are not trying to go into something more complicated than a locally convex space on the right hand side. So we have the H here. Um, and this H is a locally convex space. We are not trying to go into some sort of manifold. We are not trying to go even into an uh, into a uh, let's say more complicated open subset of H. So uh, this works because, I mean, even if uh, our manifold is not compact, this works because we are, our target is a vector space. Okay, that's the first uh, thing to be said. And uh, the second one concerns this formula 2, 1. So recall uh, that we have this formula FV and what this fv of x, this is now a smooth map from, uh, in this case, capital V with values in H, right? And uh, it's given by the assignment, if you take y, then uh, fv x of y is defined to be f of x and y. So, and the f of x, and uh, sorry, the f was uh, something which lives on the Cartesian product of the two things taking values in H. And okay, um, so what is, uh, what is happening here? So um, I would just want to remind you of these differentials we had. So if um, we have the D1 of F at some point X, Y, then uh, and say in a direction V, this is defined to be, you take the uh, differential of the mapping F, and then you're differentiating in both components. However, you're differentiating with respect to the vector V comma zero, right? So the D1 is really the partial derivative. You're only taking the derivative with respect to the first component. The second component is actually not derivated. And what this formula claims is that uh, the derivative of the FV is up to this identification process of taking the V here again. Uh, it is just given, or the derivative of the FV is given by the V of the first partial derivative of the F. And uh, we have seen this, uh, at least, or claimed that this is true in the um, uh, uh, section on uh, ordinary differential equations on uh, 
um, or beyond Barnack spaces, when we were relating the um, partial derivatives to some derivatives on uh, infinite dimensional spaces of smooth mappings, this is exactly this formula we have here. So if you don't, uh, if you, I mean, if, uh, if our spaces U and V were finite dimensional, or say U is, for example, a copy of the reals, um, then this D1 in a more traditional notation would uh, be a partial T, so time derivative, for example. Okay, so uh, the, um, this formula 2.1 is um, an important step because it really identifies what the derivative of this adjoint mapping is. And unfortunately, this is also where a lot of the technicalities of the proof are coming from. Uh, but okay, let's let's see. Let's uh, dive into the proof and see how we prove this. So we separate it into several steps. The first step will be that the FV is continuous. Okay, first of all, it suffices to prove that um, we apply the decay to the FB. So this gives us a mapping from U with values in the continuous functions on U times F to the K with values in H. Here on the right hand side with the compact open topology is con that these mappings are, uh, that this is continuous for all K in the natural numbers. The reason for this is we saw yesterday that the compact open C infinity topology, if the target is a vector space, so again, we are applying that our uh, target H here is a vector space. Um, so the topology is um, initial with respect to this family given by these mappings DK. So we are just using the initial initiality of this uh, of the compact open C infinity topology with respect to these DK. Okay, and now. Let's prove this by induction. Fortunately, um, we know already the case k is equal to zero. Um, then this is proposition b. One eight. Recall that when we were talking about the compact open topology, this proposition B18 was stating exactly that this FV uh, as a mapping from uh, some topological space with values in a space of continuous mappings, uh, that this mapping is indeed continuous. Okay. So the, uh, the case K equal to zero, that was uh, dealt with in this uh, section on the compact open topology. Um, okay, um, let's now um, uh, for k um, uh, larger than zero, we shall prove that also the following formula is okay. I compose the dk with f v at some point x, then this is well, dk of f v at x, and uh, it turns out that this is the k fold partial derivative with respect to the second argument of f. So then I apply again this uh, adjoint operator v and evaluate an x. The, uh, we shall show that this is true for all x in u. Okay, and uh, again, since uh, uh, d2 uh, 0 of f is by definition just f, uh, the case um, k equal to 0, so I should show that like that, case k equal to zero uh, follows trivially. Uh, so it, it will be convenient to have also the formula for k equal to zero. Okay, 
let us now compute. what uh, this dk of fv of x is when we evaluate this in, uh, we start at a point y and we have now k directions in which we have derivated this one. Okay, so by definition, this is the limit as t goes to zero, t inverse, multiplied with dk minus one of fv of x. And uh, now we have to insert the argument. So this is x, uh, sorry, not x, y. This is y plus t times vk. And then we have to take v1 until vk minus one. And then we have to subtract minus dk minus one fv of x. And uh, so the rest, so y, v1, to v, k, minus 1. Okay, to close the brackets here. Okay. Right, so let's, let's write out what this actually means to t uh, in terms now of the f. So um, what, what do we mean by, oh, let's, let's evaluate now what the, um, uh, dk minus one of the fv really is. Uh, so by induction, or by our induction hypothesis, what we get here is this is the limit as t goes to zero, t inverse, multiplied with, so we need a little bit of space. So we have now mm, basically the following. Um, we have d k minus one of f um, x of um, okay. Let's let's write it out in, in um, this sense. We have y plus t times v k. And then here we have the derivative, and we've taken the derivative, uh, the full derivative of f with respect to uh, 0, comma v1 up to 0, comma vk minus 1. And here we are subtracting dk minus 1 of f, and now we have to basically copy all of the above uh, without the parameter. So what I, what I could also say, just to remind you of the notation. So what is what is this guy here? What's up with the zero comma and then the other ones? So the yellow contribution is actually the same as I take k minus one times the um, partial derivative with respect to the second component. That's also why this is the induction hypothesis. So I was hiding it uh, a little bit. So x, uh, y plus t, v, k. And then I have derivated with respect to v1, to v, k minus one. Yeah, so instead of, uh, instead of writing in the yellow formula the partial derivative with respect to the second component, I expressed it as a full derivative or full iterated derivative uh, with respect to the original mapping and not with this partial, as this partial derivative. However, um, if we do this uh, and express the full thing, what is this limit? So we know that the f is smooth, so it's no problem to compute the limit. Uh, and when you just look at what, what we've done, so we have taken a differential quotient for the um, k minus first derivative of f, with respect to some uh, some uh, some parameters, and we have derivated uh, again. However, we have only derivated in the second component in y plus uh, in y. We have not derivated in the first component in x. So what this means is to write it again as a as a mapping of the uh, as a di differential of the full map. So this is dk of f x y derivative well. 0 to v1 up to 
0 to vk. Or if I want to write this with partial derivatives, it's actually, I mean, this is just a rewriting, so it's just change of notation. Uh, so this is the same as dk second, uh, of, uh, second partial derivative of f um, x y, then we have the v1 to vk. Okay. Okay, what, what does this tell us? Um, this identifies um, dk composed with the f uh, v just as the following. So we just have d2k of f, then we have to take v. And again, this mapping is continuous by this proposition um, B one eight, right? That was that was uh, the proposition stated that if we have a continuous map, so here we have the continuous map uh, on a product, and we use this adjoint operations, so we are writing out the v of this then this gives us a continuous map into uh, a space uh, into a space of continuous map with a compact open topology and the upshot of this whole construction is um, that the v uh, the fv is continuous okay so this was the first step we have now continuity with this uh, computation and what you see is the argument is basically just a clever identification of uh, the derivatives we are taking here and this dk operator. So uh, we have here, so the d uh, to the kth power. What one should really think of this guy, I mean, we have, say, uh, we have said that the uh, topology on uh, the C infinity functions is uh, initial with respect to these dk. And, um, so the uh, so the in, the initiality here means that uh, so these mappings look like this to remind you the infinity v there is an h goes to the infinity u uh, sorry um, um, okay there was a um, probably this should be, uh, Should be like this, right? Let's see, I check my notation. Yes. Ah, the f was correct, but the u in the first uh, in the first component was uh, was not correct. So this is here we have a v times f to the k h the compact open topology, right? And what the what it does? So it says sends f. No, no, let's not call it f. Let's call it g. So it sends this g to the kth derivative of the f. And from the perspective of the fv, what this uh, operator is doing, um, what this operator here is doing, it's basically taking partial derivatives in the second component with respect to the original mapping f, right? So, and this is exactly what is expressed in this formula, okay. Now, second step, the FV is actually a C1 map and its derivative satisfies uh, this equation to one. Yeah, that was the identification we had. Okay, and now, Unfortunately, this is a little bit of a technical argument and, and the main hassle of this proof is step two. Once we are done with step two, uh, we are basically good, at least when it comes to this lemma. So pick X, let's pick a point in our open set, a direction in the ambient space and uh, T in the reals uh, small. So with small, I mean all of what I'm writing down um, 
should make sense. So we can always achieve this by taking um, the t small enough. And we are defining a mapping now, which I call delta t x z. And I define it as t inverse of f v x plus t z minus f v of x. Right, and uh, so those are the differential quotients for the FV. And what we shall show is that uh, this thing, as T converges to zero, this will converge to D1F of the V. Uh, and then we take V to X. Here, we have not evaluated in this component, but we have taken the uh, Z in here. Okay, so this is what we want to show. And uh, we want to show that this uh, limit exists as we send t to zero in the C infinity functions from V to H. Yeah, so we, um, we now need to, work, uh, we need to see that this limit now really exists in the C infinity functions. So we need to be working um, with respect to the compact open C infinity topology. Okay, um, again, we use that uh, this topology is initial with respect to the mappings dk, right? So we, uh, that's what it was exactly what we had, what we had done before. Um, okay, um, and what this means is that um, Delta converges if and only if dk composed with delta converges. Okay, what I mean by this, obviously, for t going to zero uh, for all k, zero, and um, okay, so we have to prove this. And uh, so let us uh, prove this for any k in uh, the natural numbers R0. Uh, so we pick uh, input k u of the following thing of dk applied to d1f. Um, v. So what this means is, uh, I mean, we, we what we want to show, uh, we, we now prove that whenever we pick uh, a sub-basic neighborhood around uh, the point we uh, we claim that this is uh, the limit point, or I mean the limit function in this case, this will be uh, the li a limit uh, of uh, the above, hopefully, and we want to see, uh, we want to test in the decay. So um, we basically pick uh, an, a sub-basic sub -basic neighborhood such that uh, the decay composed with what we claim is the limit is contained in there. And what we want to be seeing is that for t small, eventually our uh, delta enters this neighborhood, okay? And however, let's let's explain what do I, what is uh, this sub basic neighborhood in this case. So since we say we want a sub basic neighborhood surrounding d k of uh, the limit, this means that the k is actually a compact subset of the space v times f to the kth power. Yeah. So this is compact such that um, d1 uh, f v um, and then I have to take the dk here um, of this uh, need to be evaluating this x dot z 
easy um, of the K is contained in U and the U is an open subset of the H. So since we, since we are, I mean, what, uh, when we were talking about the compact open topology, we always want to be mapping some um, compact subset into an open subset. And in this case, because we have also composed with the DK here, uh, our compact subset is now coming from this more complicated Cartesian product. It's not just a compact subset from the V, but um, what uh, the thing in the red uh, box is, uh, uh, is, is already a, an iterated differential of the K, uh, sorry, of the F. And uh, this compact open neighborhood controls now what this, uh, what this iterated differential is doing, uh, or where it lives. Okay, um, okay, let's note something that by uh, Schwartz um, theorem, we have the following. So if we take dk of uh, d1f, which some x, z, and then we take y, uh, v1 to vk. So we are, Schwartz theorems tells us that all higher derivatives are symmetric. So if we write out what the, uh, what, what do we, uh, what does a uh, term on the left hand side mean, then this can be expressed again as a k plus first iterate differential of the original map f of two variables in x and y. And we have derivated it, okay. So first of all, we need to say, uh, we need to parse this first partial derivative. So this means we have taken a derivative in the direction z comma zero because it's a partial derivative with respect to the first variable. Now, uh, we already identified in the first step, what happens now if I take the dk here? Uh, so this is the same as taking partial derivatives with respect to the second component. So this means, so uh, we take a derivative with respect to zero comma V1, and then we are continuing to zero comma VK. And those are the K differentials which are heaped upon our function uh, F by this operator DK we have here. So, this is actually giving us uh, giving us a partial derivative in the second component. Now, uh, we haven't yet uh, used Schwartz theorem. However, what uh, by Schwartz theorem, what we are going, uh, what we are allowed to do, we can just reorder the the order of the uh, of the arguments, the green and the or uh, the yellow arguments here in the partial derivative. So what we get is x y. Then we have zero v one until zero vk, and the final thing I can write down is zero, z comma zero. Okay, so this is, um, uh, this, is uh, this is only uh, the reordering of the arguments I'm allowed to do by Schwartz. And uh, we apply now or by lemma one to eight, this was this alternative characterization. Um, of the uh, of Bastiani in differentiability, the difference quotient. Extends continuously to t equal to zero by the differential. Um, Let's apply this to dk of f. Okay, so let's define y bar as, so we have a y naught, and then we have vectors v1 to dk. This should lie inside of our compact set, and remember the compact set is a subset of v times f to the k. Okay, um, and for such a y bar, there exists 
uh, a neighborhood of y bar and y bar for neighborhood inside of v times f to the k and uh, an epsilon bigger than zero such that the following makes sense. We take the mapping from this neighborhood times the small open interval uh, to h, which does the following. So it takes one of these vectors. So I'm writing now the, uh, the overline to remember us that this is not just a single element, but it's coming from this Cartesian product from uh, v and the fk. Okay, so it takes a vector w overline to, and this takes it to t inverse f of x plus tz. Uh, sorry. w naught. Then we are taking uh, 0, v1 to 0, vk, and minus. Sorry, I was missing a dk here. dk of f, uh, x, w naught, uh, 0, v, 1, 2, 0. Uh, oops. Sorry, forgot something. Those should be w ones, w k. V and W1 to WK, where we have used the notation that the W bar is W0, W1 to WK. Uh, sorry. Yes, okay. That should be it. So, um, so okay, so this function. Uh, takes values in um, u and extends ah, sorry. obviously I was getting a little bit ahead of myself so as it as I've written it down, this is of course a function which you can where you cannot insert zero. However, this um, extends continuously to t equal to zero by the differential. Okay, uh, so we obtain. A map from n y bar times now really epsilon y bar epsilon y bar to h by taking the differential quotient and okay we are almost done with this technical stuff so um, by compactness of k we cover K by finitely many of such uh, neighborhoods. Um, let's say n y one to n y. Uh, let's say L. Um, thus, if the absolute value of our time parameter is smaller than the minimum. And one to k uh, to r to l of the epsilon y bar r. Uh, so what we see from this construction that t inverse dk f x plus tz comma v then we have uh, we get all these indices again so the differential quotient uh, x v 
zero would be one by zero three k. That this is actually contained in U by construction. In other words, so the D um, K of this uh, delta we have defined T X and Z. This is in U for all T small enough. and uh, elements, sorry. Uh, sorry, I should evaluate this here in K and elements K in or large K. So this shows that this equation 2.1 holds as um, in the at this delta t x z converges to d one f uh, v with the right uh, indices. Okay, now. Step uh, one shows that uh, D1F V is continuous. Um, and thus, so the FV is a C1 map, which concludes this step. Okay. And this was by far the most annoying of the steps to establish C1 or the C1 property for the FV. So let's take um, another step. So we haven't only claimed uh, that it's uh, that the F is C1, but we want to do in the third step F is CK for every K greater or equal than two. Okay, and uh, fortunately, this is now uh, relatively easy to do. Let us note first that uh, the auxiliary map H from U times E times V with values in H, and we send such a pair X, Y, that's uh, right, not X, Y, X, Z, Y, we send this to down here, x, z, y. We send this to the first partial derivative of f, x, y, in the direction of z. So this is smooth as f is smooth. Okay. Uh, now let's argue by induction. Which, uh, with induction start. K equal to one being step two. Yeah, so we already know in step uh, two that um, we have that um, the map F, uh, FV is CK uh, for K equal to 1. So FV is C1. Um, with the formula DFV is D1FV. Okay, so fortunately this auxiliary map here uh, can now be employed. Um, so we see what is the D1 F V. So this is nothing else but the H V. And uh, well, uh, so for the induction step, uh, 
we just need to note that um, H V is um, C K minus one by the induction hypothesis. Or in other words, the F V must be C K because it's derivative ck minus one okay and again we have this bootstrapping argument so we can repeat uh, if you want for all ck or you have the inductive proof so uh, since k was arbitrary this implies that our fv is smooth Okay, and we are we are done with the proof because uh, on one hand we have seen now that the FV is smooth and um, the <coughs> formula for the derivative was also established. Okay, unfortunately this is one of the most technical steps. Well, I mean, fortunately we are done with it now, but this is one of the most technical steps in getting this exponential law. Uh, there's no simple way to really identify what the derivative of this FV is. So one has to basically crawl through um, derivatives uh, and identify things. And the second ingredient of the proof was that we can could explicitly compute with the uh, um, with the compact open topology after we had applied these uh, mappings dk. Okay. Let me just give you uh, another piece of the puzzle, calling proposition, um, so let's assume that E and F are locally convex, U is an open subset of E, then what I claim is uh, the evaluation map. Uh, C infinity from um, U to F times U, I think there is an F, is smooth if um, U is locally compact. Or, in other words, E has to be finite dimensional. Okay, and the proof goes as follows. Um, we know already that um, the evaluation map is continuous this follows from remark two one two recall for the con i mean this locally com uh, compact uh, condition really was needed to get uh, continuous evaluation so this was this was the point uh, where we need it locally compact uh, in the in the proof that the that the evaluation is continuous otherwise it's not um, okay uh, further uh, the evaluation is linear in the first component so um, we can now already compute what this the partial derivative of the evaluation with respect to the first component. If we have here the point fx, we want to derivate in the direction g. Uh, so 
the uh, when we once we fix the x, we get a continuous linear mapping. So I can also rewrite this as d of the evaluation at this fixed point x of f in the direction of g. So this is a continuous linear map. We know what happens with the derivate continuous linear mappings. So this is then, uh, well, I mean, okay, perhaps, perhaps as, a, as an exercise, let's write it out. So the limit of t going to zero, t inverse of, uh, so in this case, we have f of uh, x plus t of gx minus f of x. And what? Well, okay. So we see that we just get g of x, or in other words, we get the evaluation of g at this point we are at. So uh, this already implies that all um, partial derivatives. of uh, the evaluation map exist. Uh, sorry, all partials of the evaluation map exist for the first variable. Okay. Um, we will now uh, apply the rule partial derivatives to prove that uh, the evaluation is, uh, well, at first C1 and uh, then C infinity. Recall what, what does this rule of partial derivatives say? So if we want to take the derivative of the evaluation since the evaluation is defined on two um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a Cartesian product. This is the same as taking the partial derivative with respect to the first and adding the partial derivative with respect to the second. We've just seen that the partial derivative with respect to the first uh, we can compute. However, we now want to see that actually this partial derivative with respect to the second uh, component also exists. And uh, we will need to compute a formula for this. Okay, so uh, let's pick a smooth mapping from U with values in um, uh, from U with values in F, and um, X in U, W in E, uh, T small again, so that everything makes sense. Let's look at t inverse of the evaluation f in x plus t w minus the evaluation of f of x. Well, of course, this is much easier written as t inverse of f of x plus t w minus f of x. And we see that this is just the differential quotient for f. So this converges to df of x in the direction w uh, as t goes to zero, right? So, and this already tells us uh, what the second partial derivative is. Um, so the second partial derivative of the variation map in f uh, x direction of c is just given by um, the following. So it's just given by df x in the direction of z. Or, in other words, we can also um, write this as um, the evaluate, or let's write f1 of the function df at the point x, w, where f1 is now an auxiliary evaluation. We define as the evaluation of the C infinity functions on u times e with values in f. Uh, sorry. times, uh, now we have to take this value, times e, going over to f, 
which takes a function of two variables, let's call it gamma, and uh, an element, let's call it A, and sends this just to gamma of A. Right, so it's an evaluation map, but it lives on a different space. So here we have the product in uh, the domain. Okay, so this is uh, continuous mapping. Okay, um, since if u is locally compact, then also this product here u times e is locally compact, so we know that's continuous. Uh, okay, and we can conclude now. that uh, the derivative of the evaluation map fx in the direction of gv, this is the de first partial derivative of this, f, uh, sorry, what is my form, x in the direction of g plus g2 f x fx in the direction of v, and we have our formula. So this is the evaluation of G in the direction of X plus our F1 of DF X V. Uh, so this exists and is continuous. So this argument shows F and also F1 are C1 maps. Okay. Um, also, the mapping sending F in C infinity from, uh, let's say, U is an F. Uh, we say, uh, apply this method D, go into the C infinity mappings from um, U times E F. So what this does, F gets sent to DF. So this one is continuous linear. It's smooth. So iteratively, um, we see that uh, the derivative B of the variation is already CK minus one when F is CK for all K international numbers, including zero. Okay, and this is another example where we have a formula for the derivative and use this bootstrapping technique because we have identified the pieces in the derivative as something which is smooth uh, or at least uh, differentiable. Um, and then we, we can sort of iteratively get more orders of differentiability for the original map. Okay, so this is uh, this is another uh, piece in the puzzle to go to the exponential law. However, uh, we are almost there uh, to, to prove the, uh, the exponential law. Um, we need another technical lemma. And before we prove this technical lemma, I think it's time for a break. So let's uh, 